A Traveller's Guide to the Forgotten Realms, Episode 3. Umbridge Hill, Axe Home, and the Dwarven Excavation. My dear Lord Sandrier, I write this letter from the most comfortable cart I've ever ridden in, in the company of half a dozen shield dwarves and their crew boss, Turkin Greenheart. We left Phandalin yesterday morning via the south road and are rising higher into the Sword Mountains, having camped overnight last night and travelling hard, with plans to arrive at my companion's home by midday. The carts are each drawn by two doughty mules heading into a rapidly descending fog. We are returning to their home near the ancient holdfast of Axholm. My travelling companions are also proving excellent tour guides, showing me many ruins and curiosities of the old roads that are steadily being re-established by new trade in the region. One site of note just a few miles south of Phandalin was Umbridge Hill, where their ancient ancestors fought a battle against another tribe of shield dwarfs during a great feud. What caused the feud, or Umbridge, between the two is now lost to time, as is the name of the other tribe. All that is known is that both sides buried their dead on top of the hill in stone cairns, upon which, a few years ago, local humans built a windmill to take advantage of the strong winds in the region. Apparently, a human woman called the Dabra Gwyn lives there now, an apothecary and potion maker, and servant of Chauntier, and serves as a healer and midwife for Phandalin. She supposedly uses the windmill to prepare ingredients for her potions that she sells to those in need. Yesterday, the weather was all glorious sunlight and clear skies, but today our cloaks cling to us and rain beads on our eyelashes, but nothing seems to damper the spirits of Harthia and Harthin. The pair, obviously thunder twins from their eerie resemblance and matching purple eyes, serenade us almost endlessly with a duet on pipes and accordion, while Turkin provides a surprisingly good bass accompaniment of songs from their clan. Most of them seem to revolve around the glory of Berenar Trusilver, the sorrow of losing Axholm, and a kind of happy bouncing song that I believe is designed to teach the history of the clan, probably to children. Between verses, we've talked about their travels. Harthia, the more talkative of the twins, told me about the two devices they wear on their clothes. One of a silver stag with golden eyes, rampant on a green field, and the other an old-fashioned dwarf-made plate gauntlet holding an axe. The first is for their clan, Greenheart, who have inhabited the surface of the Sword Mountain since time immemorial. Centuries ago, they were a minor clan pledged to Axholm, and before that, Lunglas Gauntlegrim was part of the ancient empire of Dalzun. They spent the last five centuries following the fall of Axholm as semi-nomads, roaming the Sword Mountains and slowly building their strength. She didn't want to talk about Axholm itself, saying only, you'll see when we go past. The clan recently moved into an old, lung-abandoned holdfast, a guard post for the old town, as a preamble for their attempts to retake their home. Vivacious and eager to chat, Harthia explained that she and her brother are two of the main traders for the clan, having spent their entire lives travelling between other local settlements and as far away as Waterdeep. As a member of a tiny clan that has lived above ground exclusively for many years, returning to their ancestral lands seems to have been hard for her. I do want to go home, of course I do, she told me over dinner, in a long-established secret camp, 400 feet above the Phandalin Plateau last night, and by the mother we've suffered for our dream. But almost all of us were born under an open sky, and I think that the idea of going home now isn't as simple as it was for our parents and theirs. She wouldn't speak more about it then, but turned in as she had the last watch just before dawn. The next morning was bright and cold, but warmed up quickly as we resumed our journey. The music fell silent after a couple of hours, as tall, smooth walls emerged from the mountainside, embossed with blood-red arrow slits. Closer, between 40-foot-tall bulwarks, was a gate built dwarf scale, 15 feet high, carved into the mountain and blocked with a heavy, rusted portcullis. Axholm now stands still and silent as a tomb, a few scarred marks on the ground outside, the only remnants of what might have been houses, or stores, or even parade grounds. My companions all take a moment to walk over to the bulwark walls and lay a hand on their smooth stones laid by their ancestors. I do the same giving my first ever prayer to the shield brothers on high, the dwarf gods, the Mondinzerman. Back on the road, Turkin explained the fall of Axholm. Centuries ago, it was one of the few settlements to survive the wars with Uruth Ukrypt that destroyed old Phandalin and so much else. In the aftermath, they were forced to reach out to the world to trade and communicate more widely than before. It led to tremendous wealth, the likes of which Axholm hadn't known since the fall of old Delzun. Eventually, there came to Axholm an ambassador from a nearby Moon Elf settlement, and her arrival spelled the beginning of the end. Her name was Vildara, and she initially served the town well, improving relations and trade. 
But in time, things soured, and for reasons unknown, she started to work against Axome and her interest, stirring up dissent and civil unrest among her citizens. She was eventually imprisoned, and messages were sent to her home, demanding they take her back and explanations. But while awaiting a reply that never came, Hildara tried to escape, killing two guards before dying herself in the ensuing struggle. But her spirit didn't rest, and didn't depart to rejoin the Saldarin. Instead, it lingered as a banshee, a screaming, horrifying creature, similar to a ghost bound forever to attempt to regain what it has lost. The dwarves tried everything to banish the spirit to no avail. A terrible misfortune fell upon the place, culminating in an earthquake that collapsed a significant portion of the hold, killing many. After that, the few that remained were beset by undead monsters that rose up from the lower levels, transforming their victims into mindless cannibalistic monsters. Ghouls. After that, the hold fast was abandoned, its once many thousand-fold population drastically reduced and scattered across the region. In that sorry state it remains, ruled by the stinking dead in the dark. Then he sang a hauntingly beautiful song of Axholm, written by the last Greenheart chief to set foot inside its walls. It spoke of the great limestone lord's throne, and of the stink of death found there in the final days. A verse praised the beautiful shrine to Moradin, the vaulted great hall, and the might of the Ballisti mounted in and on the walls that were not able to protect their wards from an enemy within. The final verse became a prayer to Moradin, father of the dwarves, their mother Berenar, and Duomathoin, the keeper of secrets and protector of lost things. It is a prayer of commitment and honour, of dedication to the restoration of a home and hearth that the clan has stuck to ever since. We rode on in silence thereafter. Eventually we arrived at the Greenheart Holdfast, another place built around the same time as Axholm, but on a smaller scale. We were greeted in normal dwarf fashion, with copious amounts of beer, more food than we could eat, and a night of music and revelry. I found the Greenhearts to be happy, optimistic, and gregarious people, but weary and desperately possessed of a single task that seemed to genuinely unite them. The belief that they are cursed, or perhaps charged by their gods and ancestors, drives them to retake their ancient home. But as a half-elf who has never known a home that lasted more than a few years, who am I to argue? I woke the following day with a thick head and feet sore from dancing, but was treated with cool fingers and kind words by a Theonor, a cleric of Berenar True Silver. I spent a week with them, learning their ways, the struggles that they've had re-establishing a couple of nearby mines and formal trade between themselves, Vandalin, Leylan, and a couple of other locations. At breakfast on the fifth day, Turkin offered me to join him on a quick journey to visit a group excavating another nearby ruin. Me being me, I couldn't refuse. And so, an hour after dawn, we were back on the road, heading west along the mountains. The going was fast, with a stiff breeze at our backs, and we made the excavation before lunch. The site was one of the many small holds that had fallen around the same time as Fandolin and was being cleared by a small company owned by a couple of friends, Dalzin Greyshard and Norbus Ironrune, who were prospectors and explorers. While searching for gold prospects, they investigated a canyon and discovered the old settlement, whose name is long lost, buried. They've spent several months clearing the site and have found a disturbing temple to Abathor, the dwarf god of greed. Norbus told me over a cup of beer that his working hypothesis is that the temple fell short on its regular sacrifices to the great master of greed, who chose to destroy his worshippers in a fit of rage and dropped part of the mountainside upon them. The excavation is about roughly equidistant between Leyland and Fandolin, hidden in a canyon with walls rising 80 feet on either side. At the end of the canyon is a damaged wall 20 feet high, with a broken gate, inside which the excavators have made their camp. There, shielded from the outside walls, it is eerily silent, and one quickly learns to speak in whispers, to avoid the echoes that are thrown by even normal speech that take far too long to fade. Inside the outer wall there are piles of rubble that have been separated from the avalanche for later investigation, and further in, another wall, just ten feet high, which gives access to the wider complex. The hold itself is carved directly from the canyon wall, with steps leading up to the entrance and thirty-foot-high façade. The door is flanked by carved effigies of dwarves with malicious grins and daggers beneath their cloaks. Inside, the hold is pitch black, like most isolated dwarf buildings, as they can see quite adequately without light. I ventured only just inside the first chamber, but found it still choked with rubble, debris and decay. The place is carved intricately from the mountain itself, with ten foot high ceilings, smooth walls and stone doors that seem to vanish into the walls when closed. Dalzin and Norbus don't seem to be particularly rushed about their work content to take their time to preserve the ruins, and possibly find hordes of the Master of Greed's treasure. 
The only thing that troubles them are recent reports of orc activity in the area, and they are taking increased precautions to ensure that should they be attacked, they will be able to withstand. Turkin promised to bring another load of provisions and news in a ten days' time, and we packed for the return journey, which proved just as uneventful as the one outbound. We arrived back in time for dinner and found a group of gnomes from another nearby settlement called Gnomengard, already enjoying the hospitality. They have stories about the concerns of the mental health of one of their kings, and have come to perform their normal out trade without fear of upsetting him. Feanor Grisander has volunteered to travel back with them to see if the powers of Berenar can help their leader, and has even offered me a place in her cart. We're setting off tomorrow morning, from where I will hopefully prepare my next letter for you, my lord. My current plan for the immediate future is to continue north and east along these mountains, hopefully to see the towering ice fire hold, a landmark called Riven Tor, and the ancient Netherese ruin of Old Owlwell before heading north into Neverwinter Wood and back to Neverwinter to resupply, then either resume my plans for Waterdeep and the Moonshays, or abandon them for Luskan and distant Icewind Dale. Doubtless there will be several twists and turns along the way, whichever route I choose. I have no idea when you will receive this message, but please rest assured that they will keep coming, with increased regularity, I hope. I remain your humble servant, Falrian. There is always another dawn, justice and good above all. If you like this video, please like and comment so I can know whether people are appreciating this content, then subscribe and ring the bell to remain notified of new releases which will hopefully be coming much more frequently from now on. Please have a look at fiverr.com slash character law if you'd like a custom made character, NPC, organisation or town creating. I've recently even started making campaigns and short adventures. But if not, rest assured, I value each and every one of you viewing my videos. All hail Chauntier the Great Mother, this is Thomas of the Lawland.